privilege, as always, to have uh, my dad share a couple weeks ago and bring wisdom to uh, the life of our church and to have uh, PJ Moon, Pastor PJ Moon, share last week. And so uh, just super grateful uh, that whenever we are gone, we are in good hands. And so I just want to say thank you to them. Uh, before I jump in, I want to uh, acknowledge that for most of us, if you've been on social media or watch the news at all, you're starting to see some of the aftermath of this uh, hurricane that's hit. Um, it seems like it's uh, doing uh, not just damage where it's hit in Florida, but up the coast into North Carolina and Tennessee and some of these places where there's just mass flooding and people being displaced, people losing life, uh, just the destruction of it. And, uh, and so I thought this morning uh, I was going to say a couple of things about that and then, uh, and then we're going to pray. Uh, for everyone who finds themselves in the midst of this. Uh, we have a good friend, um, John Eldridge, Pastor John Eldridge. He, he's in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, they just remodeled their, their church from the last hurricane. They have two feet of water in their church. Uh, we have churches uh, up in North Carolina that are being affected by this. And Pastor Jay is on his way to North Carolina this morning. Um, to be there to facilitate uh, disaster relief through Foursquare Disaster Relief. And uh, so we're going to, as a church, as a church community, we're going to do something, um, w w some sort of financial gift. Um, Kirk Goslin from our church uh, was already is already on his way, or if not in Florida now, with the box truck uh, that is sometimes stored here that you've seen around. And uh, and so they were taking some supplies, uh, but we're going to do something as a church family, but I also want to just open it up that if that's something that you're wanting to do, maybe it's something that God stirs on your heart and you want to give towards that, uh, you can put that on the car or on the um, envelope in the seat backs in front of you and just mark it FDR or Foursquare Disaster Relief, and we'll make sure those funds get appropriated towards uh, the d disaster relief efforts in all of these areas, because it's a lot, and there's a lot of people who are hurting and um, dealing with loss right now. So can we pray uh, for that? Father, we, uh, we are grateful that every morning that we wake up, your mercies are new, and we just recognize that your mercies are new even in the mornings when we wake up and there's destruction and there's loss and there's uh, just kind of chaos uh, without water and without electricity and all just all of this stuff. Uh, and it seems like it's just, it's never ending. The, the chaos in this world is never ending. And so, Lord, we just go to you and we find uh, comfort and shelter uh, in, in your presence today. Uh, Lord, be with those people who, are, uh, who have lost, uh, whether it's loss of life or loss of things. Lord, we just, we know how painful and challenging that can be. And Lord, be with the emergency responders as they go in and assess damage and begin the cleanup of all of this. Lord, we just pray for strength and wisdom in the midst of all that. And be with Pastor Jay. He navigates the disbursement of relief and funds and all of that. That you would give him wisdom in all of this as well, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be back. Um, that's actually not true. Uh, I got back on Thursday and and I, I 
I, I had to make my own coffee uh, when I got up. I know, right? It's super sad. Like every morning, somebody made me a cappuccino. And uh, Kelly and I had the privilege to go to Italy. Sounds super pretentious, I know. Uh, but I'm being honest with you. I'm like, yeah, I mean, was I ready to come back? I was ready to see my kids. Uh, and, and my church family. And my church family. That too. Um, we're going to jump into uh, a new series. We're in the midst of a political season, as most of you know, unless you've been living under a rock. And in, the, in these political times, uh, oftentimes it becomes very divisive, but also you start seeing ads, not just in presidential politics, but in local politics, you start seeing all these ads of people telling you who they are and what they can do for you. Like trying to get your vote and trying to encourage you to vote for them over the other person. And, and so there's like all of this information that's being thrown at us about who they are and what they can do for you. And I thought in the midst of all of that noise, that maybe we could go into a series where we hear Jesus telling us who he is and what he can do for us. Because at the end of the day, regardless of the outcome of politics, and honestly, the outcome is uh, very impactful in the future of our country and our local governments and all that. We need to vote. Get out and vote. It is our civic duty to do that. But regardless of the outcome of all of this, the one thing that matters in, in the midst of all of this is our relationship with Jesus and whether we have one or we don't. And so I wanted us to go into a season where uh, we would address kind of these I am statements that Jesus made about who he is and the promises of what he can do in our life. These two words that spoke volumes, two words that echoed throughout the Old Testament narratives, these two words angered Jesus' opponents but they breathed life into the disciples. There were seven kind of bold, remarkable statements in the Gospel of John that were attached to these two words, I am. These words give us a profound insight into Jesus' identity, and it also helps us how to find ours. Our cries of, I am empty, are met with, I am the bread of life. Our pleas of, I am lost, I can't find my way, I need direction, are countered with, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Two simple words addressing every one of our fears, our doubts, our pain, and those two words are, I am. All right, so we're going to jump in, and we're going to address these seven statements, the first one being, I am the bread of life. But before we kind of get into that, I just need to take an informal poll. Is there anyone, just with a raise of hands, that have ever received like a Grubhub or an Uber Eats order delivered to their house that they didn't order? It came to your house wrongly. In first service, we had like six, and I'm like, really? That seems like terrible. Okay, there's a few. Anybody else? So if you've ever had that happen to you, it's pretty, it's like Christmas morning, right? Because a meal shows up, you didn't order it, you didn't pay for it, but here it is. And you feel a little guilty eating it, but you didn't, what are you going to do? It's food. It's not like you're going to send it back, right? By the time it gets back, it's going to be, so you like nibble on it or you eat it or you throw it away, it doesn't matter because you didn't pay for it. Well, there's a true story about a guy named Kevin Stonehouse, and this happened to him. Grubhub rang his doorbell, dropped off some chicken tenders and cheese fries. At first he was pleased, right, thinking that God actually sees him and loves him and knows him, right? It was this this epiphany that he was having, but, but then it was followed up with like three more orders within the next 10 minutes, all addressed to him. And they kept coming. And he couldn't figure out what in the world was going on until he remembered earlier he had seen his son Mason, six years old, walking around with his phone. 
And apparently, Mason had gotten onto the Grubhub app and just started ordering whatever looked good to him. After the fifth order showed up, Kevin went looking for Mason and found him hiding under the bed. He said, son, what are you doing? To which Mason said, I was hungry. Kevin started to explain why this was not okay when all of a sudden the doorbell rings again and his son said, oh, that must be my pizza. (laughs) His son Mason had put in an order for $439 worth of pizza. True story. All told, his son had ordered $1,500 worth of food. So Kevin and his wife packed out their freezers, made emergency calls to their neighbors, come, take some food, and then immediately put new passcodes on their phones. (laughs) By the way, this is why you don't let your children have smartphones. Listen, hunger can drive you to do all kinds, uh, like all kinds of of things. It It can cause you to make all kinds of bad decisions. Hunger is one of the worst feelings a human can experience. When you're hungry, one of the first things that happens is your mood changes. Uh, My daughter at times will say, Dad, I'm starving. And I'm like, no, there's kids in Africa. Those kids are starving. You're not starving. But that's beside the point. Hunger, the very first thing that that changes when you're hungry is your mood, not mine. I can go all day without eating anything, and my mood never changes. You can ask my wife about that. She knows this to be true, (laughs) and that's not true. But I have this friend, uh, his name's Eric, and he was on staff with me at our previous church up in Spokane, Washington, and uh, and we didn't have a lot of money to remodel our youth room, and so I, he was the worship leader. I was the youth pastor, and so I asked him to help me. He was really handy, and so we're on a scissor lift, and he's like 6'5". We're doing all of the electrical and rewiring stuff, and, um, and so he, he's 6'5", really skinny, and, and the day's going on. It's just dragging on into the night, into the night. Eric Svensson is one of the nicest guys you've ever met. Super nice, super friendly, always asking how everybody's doing. I've never heard him yell at anybody. But all of a sudden, as we're working together on this lift, he looks at me and yells at me and says, you had one job, to keep me fed. That was it. And he lowered the lift and he left. That was it. And I was like, what in the world just happened And it turns out he gets, what do we call it, hangry, right? You get hangry, and he was hangry. So the next day, I asked him to help, but I had like this whole spread of food out. He could snack the entire time. It turns out he needed to eat all the time. But after our mood changes, what happens is we lose the ability to concentrate, And eventually, if you continue to starve yourself, you have trouble sleeping, which is the worst. And then, of course, your muscles start breaking down, your immune system is compromised, and eventually your body just stops working. And I would argue the same thing is true spiritually. And today, we're going to see how Jesus satisfies the deep spiritual hunger that we all have. And if I could be so bold, the core of most of our spiritual problems is spiritual hunger. Like if we were to trace out some of the worst choices that we've ever made or uh, problems that we've had, bad habits that we've gotten ourselves into, addictions, even some of the emotional uh, challenges that we've had with anxiety or OCD, if we were to trace them back to their source, for a lot of them you're going to find a deep and unsatisfied spiritual hunger. John chapter 6 is where we're going to be. If you have your Bibles, you can open it up. And I heard a pastor say this, uh, and I thought it was funny, but I shared it with First Service, and they didn't laugh. So I don't know if I'm going to say it, but open up your Bibles, whether the Bible is in your lap or on the app. You guys gave a little bit more of like a dad humor response to that, which was better than first service. They didn't, nothing. It was nothing. 
And I thought, well, maybe this is just a pastor joke. I don't know. But let's move on. Jesus' seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. John structures his gospel around these seven statements. And uh, the first one is found in verse 35 when he says, I am the bread of life. And I want to give a little bit of background. Uh, The two words, I am, was the name that God identified himself with when he first appeared to Moses in the burning bush, if you're familiar with that story. In that encounter, God told Moses that he was to lead Israel out of captivity from the Egyptians, and Moses, Moses responded by saying, and who shall I tell Israel is coming to deliver them? In other words, what is your name? See, names in those days were very important. Someone's name identified where they came from, what kind of person they were, what kind of resources they brought with them. And so Moses is, in essence, asking, how can we be sure that you will be able to help us? And God's answer to Moses was simple. It was, I am who I am. Tell them, I am sent you. It was kind of an odd thing to say because in Hebrew, just like in English, you'd normally follow I am with some sort of adjective, right? I am strong. I am victorious. But God just left it with I am, meaning I'm not like you, Moses. I don't have a beginning and an ending. I don't, I don't come from anywhere. I'm I don't depend on anyone. I'm fully self-sufficient. Now, whatever you need, whatever you lack, like I am. That's what God says to Moses. And so from that point forward, whenever Israel had a need, God would invoke the name I am and attach to it whatever attribute met Israel's need in that moment. When Israel was hungry and afraid, they called him Jehovah Jireh, meaning I am your provider. In Exodus 14, when the Israelites were sick because they drunk, uh, drank from a poisoned well, God called himself Jehovah Rapha, meaning I am your healer. When they were afraid, he called himself Jehovah Shema, I am the God who is ever present with you. And so that brings us to John chapter 6, the Gospel of John. And in John, Jesus takes the name I am, and then he applies the seven greatest areas of human brokenness. And make no mistake about it, what Jesus is doing here as he uses the term I am, he is referring to himself as God. He is claiming to be God. And even further, he's claiming to be the God that we crave, the God who is the missing piece in our lives. And the first of those I am claims here in John chapter 6 is verse 35, I am the bread of life. Listen, there's no more primal feeling of need than hunger. And what I've come to discover is that there is no more universal satisfaction to hunger than bread. A relationship with God through Jesus is to our souls what bread is to our bodies. Kelly and I, as I said, just came back from uh, two weeks of vacation and uh, we had the privilege to go to Italy, and uh, we, this is the fourth time we've been there. Uh, if you're new to LifeHouse, I'm big on points and miles, so we're able to figure that all out, and we've been planning this trip for a year, and and up leading up to it, I thought, you know what, I'm going to lose some weight, and some of you were super kind and said, it looks like you're losing some weight, and starting from May till we left at the beginning of September, I had lost uh, over 20 pounds, almost 30 pounds. Uh, and I've since put half of that back on, um, but I didn't eat any bread leading up to our vacation. You know, I was trying to be healthy. I was trying not to eat the, the carbs and, you know, and the weed and all of that and the gluten, and, and, uh, and then we get to Italy, and every place we sit down puts a bottle of olive oil in front of you and a basket of bread, and what I didn't know 
after five times of being there, is that the bread in Italy uh, doesn't have calories. And so you just eat it, and you eat it, and you eat it, and you eat it. And what I've come to discover is that the universal satisfaction to hunger is bread. So to get our minds around what's going on in this chapter, and this is not going to be the only time you hear me talk about Italy, I got back on Thursday night, so or really Thursday morning. Uh, and so I put a message together. I'm talking about I am the bread of life. You know we're going to talk about food today. And so my points are a sign, a sandwich, a satisfaction, and a supper. And you might be thinking, that's a lot of food references. And as I said, I just got back from Italy. Most people go to Italy to the museums and the coliseums and the, uh, and the history. And they go to the beautiful landscapes and the Instagram photos. I go for the cacio e pepe. I go for the clam spaghetti. I go for the food. That's why I'm here. And that's why I put back on so much weight. All right. Let's first talk about a sign. And again, I apologize for all my Italian references, but if you are going to find a restaurant in Italy, you're going to want to look for a sign down an alleyway. Just if you ever go to Italy, let me just give you some uh, insight into this. If somebody's standing along the street and they got pictures of their food and they invite you into their restaurant, go somewhere else. Okay, that's, go, that's for tourists. You want to find a place down an alleyway that has a little indescript sign there, and that's where you're going to find good food. You can say, well, what does that have to do with anything other than the fact that Jesus made this audacious claim that I am the bread of life right after performing one of his greatest signs? And this was one of the greatest signs that I saw in Italy. So, all right. So Jesus makes this audacious claim right after he makes, he gives one of the greatest signs that we see in Scripture, and it's called the feeding of the 5,000. In fact, the miracle was the setup. It was the sign for the claim, I am the bread of life. And so we're going to walk through it. In verse 4, it says, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. We're going to come back and, and talk about the significance of the Passover uh, that, that Jesus is, or that's being referenced here. Uh, verse 5, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Verse 6, he said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. The first thing Jesus does is to test the disciples. He's testing them. He wants to prove something to them. He wants them to see how utterly unable or unable they are in themselves to meet this need. Like it's impossible for them to come up with a solution for this problem. Philip responds in verse 7, he says, Well, 200 denarii isn't enough to buy food for these people. And 200 denarii would have been like eight months worth of salary or of wages. So Philip is in essence saying the assignment is beyond us. Like, we could save up money for as long as we live, and by the time we got enough money, these people would be dead. So, another disciple speaks up, verse 8, and says, I found a little boy here whose mom packed him a lunch of loaves and two fish. Five loaves, two fish, and he says he's willing to share it with us, right? But it's just one kid's lunch, and it's probably not big loaves of bread, Right, because it's just one kid, unless his mom was like, hey, we got some leftover bread. Go share it with your friends. But it's probably small, small rolls of bread and these two small fish. And, and so they're like, what are we going to do with this? It's like a fillet of fish, right? It's like a Happy Meal. It's all we got. It's, it's, it's not a lot. And so having sufficiently made his point, Jesus tells his disciples, you know what? Just give me the, the loaves of bread. Give me the fish. And he prays over them, and the disciples start to distribute them. I want you to put yourself in that story for a second as one of the disciples. You, you see these five loaves of bread, these two fish. It's not a lot of food. 
Jesus prays over it. And my question is, does when Jesus pray over it, all of a sudden it begins multiplying and they're like, oh, okay, let's start handing it out. Or does after they start handing it out in faith, does the stuff start multiplying? If it's the latter, then imagine what it must have been like for the disciples. They're walking around with five loaves and two fish, and they go up, and they're like, well, this is going to go quick. And it just doesn't run out. It keeps multiplying. It keeps multiplying. And Scripture tells us that at the end of all of this, they had 12 baskets full of leftovers. Verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. What had they seen? Right? When the people had seen this, what, what had they recognized? Well, I want you to kind of back up a little bit with me because all of these people who would have been sitting listening to Jesus, and including his disciples, would have known the story of Exodus. Right? When God delivers Israel from Egypt and as they're passing through the wilderness, they had found themselves in a place without food. And so every morning of every day of every week, except for the Sabbath, God covered the ground with a little bread-like substance. And the best way to describe it is maybe like a, a cracker with honey on it, glazed in honey, right? I like to envision it since, you know, I just got back from Italy, as like little bruschettas, right? Just all over the ground. Yeah, all right. You guys are going to get really, I mean, if, if you're already sick of my references, uh, it's going to be a long morning. But every morning, the people of Israel would collect this, this little cracker, this little piece of bread that had this sweetness on it, and they didn't know what to call it. And so they called it manna, which in Hebrew literally meant, what is it? And this is what they ate every day as they passed through the wilderness. And you say, that sounds like a pretty boring diet. Yeah, but I mean... I already told you that I had bread every single day while I was in Italy. They just keep bringing it, and it's awesome. And so it sounds boring, but it tastes fantastic. So here we are now in John chapter 6, a couple of thousand years later, and Israel is again under the thumb of an oppressor. This time it's the Romans, right? And they're waiting for another deliverer similar to Moses, who can deliver them from the Romans, like Moses delivered them from the Egyptians. And they're listening to the story, and they see Jesus perform this miracle where now he's multiplying bread. And here they have a new prophet providing a new manna and instituting a new Passover meal. And at the end, there are 12 baskets left over, which clearly represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Everybody knew exactly what those 12 baskets represented. So they concluded that this was the prophet, the deliverer, the one that they had been waiting for. Hence their statement in verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Not just a prophet, but the prophet. This is the deliverer we've been waiting on. This is the Messiah. This is the one the whole Old Testament pointed to. And then in verse 15, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. They were going to politicize Jesus. They were going to, they were going to anoint him as their king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is a reminder to us that they understood the sign, but they also completely misunderstood the sign. They thought the point was Jesus' ability to put food in their stomachs and overthrow the kingdom of Rome. But it wasn't the point. His point was, in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He says to them, you've got a much deeper problem than the Romans. A deeper problem than an empty stomach, and that is your soul is starving. And just being delivered from your oppressors won't fix that. And just getting food in your belly won't fix that. What you need most, 
what you crave is a relationship with me. I am the bread of life. I'm not going to give you the bread of life. I'm, I am the bread of true life. And my guess this morning is that there is many of us who come with an expectation. We, we come to church with these ideas, thinking of something that we need from Jesus. We need a new job. We need help with our marriage. We need help with our kids. Right? Some, some are trying to get pregnant and, and going through difficulties of that. They, they have a need to get pregnant. They need new friends. They need a miracle for their health. And Jesus is not insensitive to those. As we see in the story, Jesus does meet their need of food. Like he puts food in their stomachs. He's not insensitive. He cares about our needs. He cares about our empty stomachs. But what you most need is not the miracle itself. You need the maker of those miracles. You think, oh, if only Jesus would give me this, or if only Jesus would give me that thing, or do this for me, if he would only bring breakthrough in this part of my life, but there's nothing in creation that can satisfy you like the bread of life. And what you crave is the creator. And so the Jews understood the sign, but they also misunderstood it, which brings us to the second point, which is the sandwich. This is is a sandwich from the best sandwich shop in all of Sorrento, Italy. And I would like to tell you how good it is, but when I got there, because my son recommended it, it was closed. It was super sad. There's a picture of me praying over the place, actually. So how does Jesus teach them the real meaning of what he's saying? Right? You'd expect the heading over the next verses to be Jesus explains to the crowd the true meaning of the miracle. But instead, if you look at your Bibles, what will you find? Jesus walks on water. Instead of teaching them the meaning, he does this seemingly random miracle. He sends the disciples on ahead of him across the sea to a place called Capernaum. And so they're going across the Sea of Galilee. They get into this massive storm which scares the ever-living life out of them. And in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the night, Jesus calmly walks out across the water like it's not a big deal. He climbs into the boat with them and two things happen. One, the storm is calmed, and in verse, uh, verse 21 says, immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going, which to me is at least the coolest part. I mean, it's both of them are cool. Like him walking across the water and scaring them, I think, in that process I think is funny. Uh, but the fact that he steps in the boat and then, bang, now they're over on the shore. The whole point of this ordeal had been to show them that he has the power that whatever storms that threatens them, he can calm. But now they're in Capernaum. And verse 16 tells us that where Jesus, uh, verse 16 tells us that, uh, that that's where Jesus had sent them. And Capernaum was a part of, the, of Palestine where a lot of Gentiles lived. And it's where the ancient Gentile cities of Tyre and Sidon were. Jesus does a couple of important things there. Somebody else is listening to a better sermon, I think, than me. Um, it's fine. It's fine. I, I don't take it personally. I've been gone a couple of weeks talking about Italy and my trip. I get it. I get, I, I get it. Jesus does a couple of important things here in Capernaum. John doesn't record the next part of this story, but Matthew does and in chapter 14 and 15. And Matthew says the first thing that Jesus does when he arrives in Capernaum after feeding the 5,000 is he heals a Canaanite woman's daughter. And Canaanite meant Gentile. Canaanite was, like to the Jews, she's, she's an impure person, like referred to as kind of a dog of a person. That's how derogatory they referred to the Canaanites. 
an enemy of God. And when Jesus healed her daughter, no one can believe it, certainly not the disciples. The disciples are like, Jesus, what are you doing? Like, why, why would you heal this Gentile? She, she was just simply impure. But Jesus says, I'll heal anybody with faith. And then, get this, immediately after the healing, Matthew says that Jesus repeats the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, except this time it's only, where, it's only with like 4,000, right? So it's not that big of a deal, right? So it's 5,000 and now 4,000, and it's this almost identical miracle that takes place where they're out of food and there's some few loaves and some fish for the food. It gets prayed over. Jesus multiplies it. But at the end of it, they don't have 12 baskets. They only have seven baskets. And you think, well, does that mean Jesus is kind of losing his touch? Is he losing his gifts? Is he doesn't have the power anymore? Like seven, that doesn't seem like enough. No, it's very specific. The reason why is because during the first miracle of the manna, the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament says that Israel was surrounded by seven Canaanite nations. So these seven baskets are for them. The seven baskets mean that Jesus is the bread of life for Gentiles too. For the Jews and for the Gentiles. So what we have here is a miracle sandwich. On either side of the sandwich, the pieces of bread, so to speak, are your feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And right in the middle, right, in between the two nearly identical miracles, you have the meat of the sandwich, so to speak, and that is that Jesus walks on water and the healing of a Gentile woman's daughter. And so what's being taught here is, first, Jesus' point is not his ability to put physical bread in our stomachs and overthrow the Roman government. The point is that whatever we face, whatever storm we're in, it seems like the waves of life overtake us, whether that's a storm in our marriage or whether it's with our kids or it's a storm of addiction or whether it's something that we can't shake, Jesus can step into our sinking boat and he can bring peace. What we most need is not some kind of physical bread in our stomachs. What we need is him. And he says, I am the bread of life. Again, you, you could have come here this morning looking for a miracle, and if you did, we will pray with you for that. We will have people available to pray with you at the end of service. We would gladly pray with you and stand with you in that. But I am telling you, what you most need, what you've always craved, is the relationship with Jesus, the great I am, the maker of all miracles. The second thing the sandwich is teaching us is that we're hungry, first of all, we're ready to go eat, but that Jesus came for everybody who would receive him. He didn't come just for the pure or the church or the morally upright. He came to those who were separated from God, those who were across the sea from him. Whosoever has faith, even people like the poor Canaanite woman, He came for as many as would receive him. You might think this morning that you are miles away from the profile of what it means to be a Christian. Like every week we have people who walk through our doors and there are these these, um, people who are seeking and looking for answers to this life that we are in. I use the reference of a prophecy that was given in Ezekiel and talks about the, the standing on the banks of the river and going deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and we have people who come to our church and they're, they're not even ankle deep in this thing called Christianity and spirituality and faith. It's, they're kind of on the banks wondering, is this the answer? And so you, you, might, you might feel as though you are miles away from the river. You might feel like you're on the banks. And maybe it's because... Uh, you, you've gone through things in life that you feel like you, there's just no possible path towards God, towards forgiveness, towards grace. Maybe you've 
had an affair. Maybe it, you've gone through multiple divorces. Maybe there's abortion in your past. Maybe, maybe there's just all of these things in your life that you're like, there is no possible way. And, and honestly, for you, if that is you and you're here, the fact that you're even here is a miracle. That you've, you've pushed through all of the stereotypes of Christianity and all of the things to, to be here and to be present and, and to say, is, is, is it even possible that I could be forgiven? Maybe you've got a secret that nobody knows about, one you feel so ashamed of that you've not told anyone, right? And you, you hide from everybody. And the bottom line is you just feel miles and miles away from Jesus this morning. And I would just say to you, I've got really good news. The good news is that you have the bread of life. Jesus has not just shown up for those people who are morally right or churched or any of those things. He shows up in your Capernaum. He shows up across the water, across the sea. And he's the bread of life for you. He comes to whatever your circumstances are, your Capernaum, and he's looking for you. And he had to cross an ocean of God's wrath to get to you. But he's here. And all you have to do, like this woman, is to receive him. Which brings us back to John chapter 6 and Number three in my points is a satisfaction. I don't have a fun picture for you on this because I can't really uh, even equate anything to the satisfaction of being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. In verse 35, Jesus actually gives the explanation. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He says, I am the bread of life. Not I will give you the bread of life or I'll give you a way to live that will feel like the bread of life, but I am the bread of life. Christianity is not a lifestyle or a new way to live. It's a relationship with a person, plain and simple. By the way, if you think with me just for a moment about the absolute audacity of that statement, I am the one that you're looking for. It's popular in some academic circles to write off Jesus as just being this provocative moral teacher, of this philosopher, of, of being someone that is this moral revolutionary, right, and this great prophet. But if you think about the sheer audacity of what Jesus is saying, he's saying the words, I am, meaning God. The name of God. He's saying, I am the bread of life. I am what you crave. I am what you have always craved. I am God. In verse 34 through 40, Jesus says, I, me, my, 17 different times. I'm the bread of life. Unless you feast on me, he says, you'll starve eternally. My broken body is going to be like bread to you. Feast on me and you will live. He's making this audacious statement. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. If Jesus wasn't actually God, one of two things has to be true. Either he's the worst liar that ever emerged from the pit of hell, cruelly convincing people to worship and trust him, or else he's a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg. Right? That's crazy. And in John 6, Jesus put himself at the center of history. He puts himself at the center of the Bible, of the gospel, and he puts himself at the center of our existential crisis. He either is who he says he is, or he's not. And if he is who he really says he is, then he is the satisfaction for our deepest soul. And in him, our, those are in him. You ever wonder what that means? <laughs> the satisfaction of our deepest soul. A lot of times Christians say things like, be satisfied with Jesus or find happiness in Jesus. But what does that even really mean? It sounds like a lot of Christianese, right? It sounds like a lot of platitudes that we say because we kind of know what they mean. And so we're like, hey, all, all you need is Jesus. And, and we even sing songs about 
you're all I need, you're all I want. And does that mean that you are just serenely religious all the time, always humming God songs and thinking pious thoughts? No. Here's what it means. It means that you have the absolute assurance that you belong to him and he belongs to you. You know that because of his promises in the gospels that you've received for yourself. And that knowledge, that relationship with him is so valuable to you that when, you, when you're successful in something, you find yourself rejoicing more in possessing him than you do in the win. And when you fail at something, you console yourself knowing that he is more important than the victory anyways. You could certainly be disappointed when something doesn't work out like you want. But in failure, right, when you experience that failure, when you don't get into that school or you fail to make that team or you lose the job, your soul is never truly devastated because you have him. And he is more valuable than anything else life could give. And more secure to you than anything death could take away. Being satisfied with Jesus means the promise of his loving, guiding hand is like food to our souls. And I, I tell you that because I, I just want us to be careful as we throw platitudes around that Jesus is all I need. I mean, think about someone who doesn't understand what that means. When you say that Jesus is all you need, right off the bat, it's not true. <laughs> and you're like, uh, I think you've been on vacation too long because uh, it sounds true. No, think about it. What do you need to live? You need water. You need oxygen to breathe, right? You need food to eat. And so, is Jesus all you need? Well, well, you need these things, but yeah, but spiritually what you're saying is Jesus all I need. But when someone who doesn't understand that hears that, they immediately discount it because it just doesn't sound right. And so what we're really communicating is not that, in fact, listen to this, even God himself, when he's in the garden with Adam, he's just created Adam, right? And, Adam, and he tells Adam, name all the animals, and he names all the animals. He finds his life purpose, and he fulfills his purpose. And what does God say to Adam? It's not good for you to be alone, Adam. There's something else. So what does he do? He creates for him a relationship. He creates a relationship for Adam to have. Well, Adam didn't say to God, God, I'm so bored down here. You messed up. I need somebody. No, God is the one that's saying, I want you to have relationship with me, but I also want you to have relationship with other people. So when we, we say things like, God, you are all I need, well, yes, we do say that we are completely satisfied in our relationship when we are in relationship with God, but we also need people in our life. We don't get to do this alone. We also need water and air, and we also need food, preferably from Italy, if we're going to have it. I just don't want to communicate that, that we could just walk around saying, God, you're all I need, you're all I want. And I, I'm not making fun of that song. Like, I, I, I like the song, but, but if we're not careful, we're communicating to people who are far from Jesus a, a concept that maybe isn't quite understandable. Which brings me finally to my last point, which is a supper. And I apologize again, I have another picture for you. And it's, we're not talking about this supper, although this is cacio e pepe. It's maybe the best Italian dish that exists in all of Italy. Simple dish, but complicated. It's a whole thing. What we're really talking about here is the Lord's Supper. In verse 53, Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. As he said these things... This is what it says. It says, The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? It's like Jesus Tartar, right? You can't do that. That was gross, I know. I'm sorry. I've been on vacation. It's, uh, next week will be better, I promise. I won't even talk about it next week. 
even his disciples stumbled at this. In verse 6, he says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Jesus said something here that confused even his disciples, but with all this background, I think we're in a place to understand what he meant. Remember, at the very beginning of this story, John explained that Jesus did this miracle on the eve of Passover. Jesus is presenting himself as the new Passover. He's saying in some mysterious way, that Passover meal where the lamb was killed, the blood was sprinkled over the door frame, if you remember that story, and you ate unleavened bread, and the manna that appeared on the ground every morning, all of those things pointed to me. My blood is the real Passover blood. My body is the real manna that is broken to feed and sustain you. Like, did you know that you can't just eat raw wheat? Like, it has to go through a process. If you just eat raw wheat, it's going to make you sick, especially if you're gluten-free. But for, for wheat to become bread, it has to go through, like, this elaborate process, and it's a violent process. The grains are cut. Then they're beaten, they're winnowed, they're ground down into flour, they're processed, and then they're baked, and only then will it rise into what we call bread. What does it mean for Jesus to be the bread of life? That on the cross, Jesus was beaten. He was ground down. He was put through immense violence. And only then did he rise as our bread of life. And so on the eve of his crucifixion at another Passover meal, he has his disciples with him. Jesus presents the same idea again that we read in John 6. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And in saying that, he was setting the stage for what was about to happen. On the cross, he would become the bread of our forgiveness so that we would never have to feel starvation pangs of condemnation again. On the cross, he became cleansing for our sins so that we could be free of sin, stain and shame, so that even though our sins would be like scarlet, we sing about it, he could make them white as snow. And on the cross, he would reconcile God to me and to you so that I could feast on the bread of knowing that I'm never alone, not in any circumstance, for any reason. And on the cross, he would give me the power of new life, the power to start over, the power to build a life of beauty, even when my sin had reduced me to a pile of ashes. But to give me that kind of bread, he had to be crushed. He had to be ground down. And only then could he be raised into the bread of life. If anyone hungers, let him come and eat. He that feasts upon me will never hunger. He that believes on me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. I'll end with this. Did you know that researchers say that there are three phrases that bring the most joy to humans? And they're in this order. I love you. I forgive you. And Italy. I'm just kidding. And dinner's ready. Those are the three statements. I love you. I forgive you. And dinner's ready. And isn't it awesome that in the gospel, Jesus says all three of those things to us. If anyone hungers, let him come to Jesus and eat. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He says to us from the cross, I love you. I forgive you. Dinner's ready. I'm the bread of life. Let's pray.